Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Lester King, as I was just so wonderfully uh, introduced. And uh, I am a planner, yeah, one of those uh, few out there uh, with an actual degree in planning, believe it or not, in this city. I did my uh, postdoc at Rice University in the, uh, in the geology department. So I feel as if I do share something with you guys in the audience. You know, we both like beer. <laughs> that, was, that was very heavy. But uh, I, I was, I was uh, to tell you the truth, I, I was actually a little bit intimidated when I, when, I, when I first got there. I spent five years in the geology department, actually. That was where my office was located. I worked for uh, John Anderson. I don't know if any of you guys know his name. Um, I was intimidated because when I would see the maps on the wall, uh, you know, everything above ground was pretty much like a fifth or a half of everything like on the entire map. And so the scale was just completely, you know, just really overwhelming for me thinking about um, how scientists uh, today can actually understand the ecosystem that we're living in. And so I, I, I'm really excited to jump at the opportunity uh, to address a topic that crosses both of our areas, you know, water, because water does have that above ground and below ground kind of significance. And uh, because of that, uh, the, the research team I'm working with, um, we are uh, we're putting together um, a group to go, to go out and do community planning work. And one of the, one of the persons on our team is uh, Jeff Nitrauer, who you met yesterday. And uh, Jeff is very uh, significant in some of the communities we're working in because as, as you may or may not know, there are some silting issues out on the San Jack River. And uh, Jeff's contribution really, really comes into play there. I also have a, a question for you. Um, and I will put that question out as the, as the uh, uh, presentation goes on. I'll actually start with the question. And it came from actually a young student here, right there. And, and uh, he came up to me about 30 minutes before the presentation and he told me he wants to do a dissertation and he's looking for research questions. And so I'm wondering how I can phrase my interest in ways that would make sense to, to somebody like this guy and also you, you in the audience. So um, I quickly jot, jotted down a couple, couple questions for you. The first question is, define floodplain. Right? And is the floodplain a not is it supposed to be a naturally occurring part of the a functional ecosystem? Is that it? Uh, the other question is what happens to groundwater when a or at least the flow of groundwater when a river channel has been lined with concrete? What happens to the water coming a half a mile from there within the same watershed? Can I actually find a river creek? And at what depths uh, can I start to do so? Is there like a distance where I actually can't find it? And if I start to try to figure out a different track? Um, and part B of that question is, when that happens, then what happens to the floodplain? That naturally occurring functional part of the ecosystem. So I have a lot of questions and uh, I thought that we could discuss, for instance, the way I'm looking at this and phrasing this kind of uh, challenge that we have today. Uh, the presentation is, is uh, six different parts. Uh, the first part is I present to you a philosophical frame on sustainable development from a planner's perspective. Sustainability was started by economic, uh, economists, by the way, not environmental scientists or advocates. Uh, part two, I'll show this frame applied to floodplain planning and management. Part three, I'll show the implementation of it. Part four, I'll get to the, to the nitty gritty, which is comparing buffalo and braids. And then in part five, we'll do a sustainability assessment of uh, those two uh, channels based on the philosophical frame that I presented at the beginning. And then we'll look at some of the work my team is doing with, uh, specifically with regards to planning for uh, the mid braise communities, or at least a couple communities along the, the braise Bayou area. The philosophical frame. <clears throat> so the definition of sustainability, which is the only one that I will let my students use, is the original definition that talks about preserving the, the needs of the present generation um, and not tampering with those needs of the future generations. Um, 
sustainability also comes with it, as most people know, this idea of three pillars, right? The social, economic, and, and environmental balance that we, we actually should uh, follow. And, and you, you might be aware of some of these different ways in which those three pillars are portrayed. Sometimes as a triangle, uh, sometimes as interlocking circles, as the second chart looks from the left. And as the third one shows, you can also kind of make some of those circles larger than others. As you can well imagine, all, all four of these have different political applications. And you can see where they could be used for different reasons. Uh, number three, for instance, I'm sure the environmental advocates love that one, but not so much the uh, policy folks or even the economists. So uh, in thinking about these, this triple bottom line, as some people like to call it, uh, one planner, Scott Campbell, uh, thought about how to define the areas between those pillars. What happens between social and the economic development area? Well, he called it this property conflict. And uh, he called between, I'll, I'll explain these as, as we go along, he, he, he sought to name these, this interchange between the different pillars. Um, an institute in the following year, 1997, decided to, and, and again, this is a mere 10 years after sustainability first came on the floor as an uh, international mantra for development, uh, international as well as local development. Um, this one looks at not just this three pillars, but they raised it to look like actually a pyramid. So all of a sudden now you have a prism, and we can talk about even more connections, or at least defining ways in which we can communicate between, between each other. Um, and then another planner <laughs> comes along and says, well, okay, if we have an apex, then let's figure out how we can get from those pillars to the paradigm of sustainability, and he's calling it livability. This is David Godstock. May he rest in peace, he died earlier this year. A uh, wonderful man with a great last name, even better than mine. Uh, and he was interested in, in, you know, what are those conflicts that might occur when we go from one of the pillars to sustainability. Um, so I took his, his, uh, this, this uh, trend uh, in the literature and I created my own. Why not? You know? Uh, why don't I take both of them? And uh, I like the conflicts that Scott came up with in uh, 96. And uh, I am interested in those tools out there that are available to planners that you may or may not have heard about. New urbanism, smart growth, transit-oriented development. How can these tools be applied to get to sustainability? And so this is the prism I came up with. And uh, uh, now I'll explain to you how this could possibly be, uh, be uh, implemented. So this is where we came from. <laughs> And uh, that's where we were going, and I'm not sure if, if Gro Arlen Brutman had in mind this idea that we would change his prison. Actually, it was René Passet that came up with the idea of the uh, triple bottom line uh, back in 1979. And so, how do we apply that frame of this interconnections, these, this, this way to frame discussions, or at least frame issues, to actually uh, apply it to our, our situation? So. Uh, on the red line at the top, you see, uh, we're looking at this intersection between social development and economic development. We're talking about the property conflict that occurs there. So if you're a flood control agency or you're a city, you should be aware that these are some of the things that are going to be happening that you have to address. And this is basically the fight, or at least the conflict, between people thinking of their homes as homes and thinking of and real estate persons, or at least the city also, in some, in some cases the insurance companies, thinking of them not as homes, but flooded property. And this occurs when you think between the social side and the economic side. I have a personal friend who flooded four times in, from Allison to Harvey last year. And he moved back into his home, rag style home, at grade, two weeks ago. And he's one of the most uh, intelligent persons I know, a lawyer. Actually, he's a lawyer, <laughs> right? So I, and, and, and he lives in, in a similar community, in the same community I live in. I live on the edge of the, flood, of the 100 year floodplain. He lives in the middle of it. Um, so talk to him about this conflict because he knows it well. Um, this conflict also involves things like NIMBYism and home ownership associations and subdivision regulations. So at the local level, you gotta go below the city level when you think local for something like what we are experiencing. 
between the environmental side and the economic side, right? The environmental advocates, developers, okay? We have what we call the resource conflict. And this is about how much of the environment can you actually take and use for the benefit of mankind without actually tampering with the natural function of things. That's what this uh, 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 issue is about. Back in 1949, a brilliant guy called Wilbur Chapman got a job to uh, figure out how we can do it with fisheries. This idea of, of sustained yield came out of that. Um, and, it, and it really is the question that's happening out on the San Jacinto when we look at either the waste pit issue or we look at, again, the sand mining operations that are happening a little bit farther up. It's conflict between the natural environment and using it for the betterment of mankind. <clears throat> and the third one, which is really the one that I would like to use for the rest of the presentation, is this idea of the development conflict. This is about people and the environment, communities and the natural environment, anthropogenic needs and ecological needs. Big challenge. And so we actually in this country have the preeminent environmental treaties uh, called NEPA that most of you are very aware of. Um, and the purpose of NEPA, uh, as I say to my students, uh, this predated sustainable development as an international mantra, by the way. We did this in this country back in 1969, and everybody in Congress agreed on it. And the purpose was to declare a national policy that will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment. 69, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a big joke. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I mean, countries, countries borrow our, our, our uh, uh, environmental impact assessment process. Those who don't have their own, they say, oh, you're a US company, just use your own if you want to come here, because it's so good. Uh, so this idea of uh, protecting communities versus protecting the floodplains, which should take precedence. I like to think of balance. That's why I like the sustainability idea. Um, I believe that if we're not balanced, which is really the sustainability perspective, then you're not sustainable. And so we need to strike a balance between the so our social needs, our economic needs, and our environmental needs. So here is a vision statement that was adopted by national planners back in uh, three years ago. And the statement reads like they understand sustainable development, right? Because the state, I'm not going to read it verbatim for you. I'll just pull out a couple words in there. They talk about floodplains, which is the environmental uh, uh, point of, of, of the statement. They talk about development, which is economics. It's very important. And they talk about community goals, all in a very strong and simple vision statement, right? So it's a sustainable statement. And then they also get into principles. These principles, uh, most of them, there are five of these principles. Three of them address the development conflict, conflict which is, a, as I mentioned to you, the real conflict here. People and our communities, no, sorry, us and our communities, and the need for ecological, uh, natural function. Um, and so again, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but really these principles are addressing properly that conflict. So we have to be aware that this is really the, the central tenet. And so, what can sustainability tell us about uh, the issue that we're faced with in the region? Do you guys recognize this slide at all? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when I first started uh, doing presentations, my advisor, when I was doing my PhD, she said, remember you have to practice and you have to finish the presentation seven days before and practice over and over again and don't change a word of your presentation. <laughs> so I, I walked up to uh, the speaker earlier uh, and I asked to borrow this. And, so, and he agreed, right? I, I, I gave attribution, so don't sue me. You can sue that guy. But, but uh, I, I, like, I like this because, uh, you know, it really is a good context for looking at our situation from an ecological perspective with regards to the, uh, or, or what we call a flat Houston. It's not really flat. It's relatively flat. But water likes to see the difference between relatively and flat. And I think most of us would say it's not flat, uh, at least when it comes to surface water and, and water close to the surface. 
Um, so, so how can I use this map? You know, I'm thinking about the difference between Buffalo Bayou and Bray's Bayou, which is the point of this conversation. Look at how deep blue and larger, a little bit larger Buffalo Bayou is. And I'm wondering about Buffalo Bayou uh, actually having a very well-defined river channel, and as such, any water in that watershed probably can find it because it's so heavily defined and there's so much more water there. But look at how thin uh, Braised Bayou is, which is the one below it. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to add labels yet. It's much thinner. So water may actually have a harder time uh, finding that channel. And that's even before the rain falls. Uh, look at the watersheds. The next thing I'll do is I'd like to uh, overlay the watersheds with uh, that, that map and uh, wonder how uh, Harris County's outline of the watersheds actually superimpose on this work. Um, so Buffalo Bayou, Brace Bayou, roughly the same size, uh, 100 to 127 square miles. Brace Bayou has a few more people in its watershed, 717,000 as opposed to 444 approximately. A thousand was the population back in, in 2010. And here is how the two look when you superimpose the 100-year floodplain, which is the outline in orange. Actually, if you look at the outline in orange on other parts of the map as well, this is supposed to be the 100-year floodplain. Floodplain. And my first question, remember I asked, what is the floodplain? How do we define floodplain? Is it a naturally occurring thing? Because you heard the speaker say, you know, it's kind of political, really. How do you get there? If that is a naturally occurring thing, then it means that this natural segment needs that, or at least the ecosystem needs that uh, space. It needs to be able to recharge, it needs to be able to uh, find itself down, downstream when it, when, it when it spills its banks. But it's quite large. And so, from my perspective, I'm wondering about the error. I'm wondering if there's an error margin there. How can it be so large if it's a floodplain? What's going on here? Uh, here is a closer look using the same kind of, uh, using, using the same kind of uh, look at, at LIDAR with a residual kind of methodology rather than just the, the straight elevation. And again, where is the floodplain? So when he overlays it, he says it gets, it gets very similar. But what about this rhetoric that we've been hearing about buying out the first block or so of homes along North and South Braisewood in Meyerland? Looking at this image, do you think that would help? <laughs> Here is the outline of the Greater Meyerland Super Neighborhood. And so, even if you were to buy all the homes within the Greater Meyerland Super Neighborhood, would it remove these other people from in that 100-year floodplain or spillway? So then, really, we have questions over floodplain. If, we, if, if, it's, if it's a political outline, then we should call it the spillway. <laughs> yes. The floodplain kind of tends to science, as something natural or ecologically necessary. And so we, we do not want to point the general public who, who is, is arming themselves with a lot, of, a, a lot of, of information as much as possible. We don't want them thinking that we're going to restore area to its natural capability uh, when we look at these boundaries. Here's another map. The, the, uh, the, the blue is the 100-year floodplain as outlined back in 2000, and the gold color is the floodplain outlined in 2012. So in 12 years, you can, if you can see any orange, it means it's getting larger, somehow. How is that possible? If the river channel, from a science perspective, if the river channel is, as you know, the evolution of a river, it's going to go deeper over time, shouldn't the spillway or floodplain shouldn't it become less as the water becomes more efficient at actually getting to that point, which is why it gets deeper, right? So if it goes larger, there's an error in there, and I think it might be based on anthropogenic contributions to this. Uh, here's that map again, and now let's look at this assessment. Based on what we've talked about, how can we analyze these two different functions in these two watersheds and channels? based on the sustainability prism and, and the pillars. So from the socioeconomic perspective, which ones have public access? Well, we know that Braze has absolute public access in most parts, and Buffalo does not, uh, as it runs through uh, Memorial, I'm sorry, as it runs through River Oaks and, and some of the more wealthy communities, 
because they're living right next to the bayou. So Brace has a lot of public accesses and high public use, uh, use, utility uh, and lots of residential activity. You can kayak and canoe in Buffalo. It wouldn't mean the same thing in, in Brace. You, know, you could do it, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be some, some heavy, heavy slogging. Uh, so both bayous and their 100-year floodplains have a substantial degree of human activity, human contact. We use these things. Uh, Buffalo has more recreation, Brace has a higher public accessibility from a sustainability prism. Now on the environmental side, how do they function? Okay, when it comes to natural flood and erosion, right? Uh, Buffalo can slow some of that stuff down, okay? And uh, stabilize the soils as well. Brace, you can't do that with a concrete channel. When it comes to surface water quality, again, the stuff growing on the site of Buffalo and maybe in the channel as well acts as a filtration system very nicely. Brazy can't get that. Groundwater supply and quality. Uh, water can get into the groundwater uh, along Buffalo. It cannot do that on Brace. Floor, biological diversity. Brace doesn't, doesn't, doesn't function in the same way. Fish and wildlife habitat. I was going to put no, but then I remember those catfish in, uh, in uh, Brace Bayou and those are they're there, and they, you know, they might not you know, have been there 100 years ago, but they live there now. Uh, and when it comes to scientific study, you, you can study brains, you know, to a certain extent. There's some limited science, so I wouldn't write it off completely. But you can see they, they function very differently ecologically. And so, you know, from my perspective, I, I would say, you know, buffalo should be protected as much as it can for the ecosystem, because we need that. The ecosystem needs it. Braze, not so much. So again, what is the floodplain? Should it, is, is it something that should be returned to its naturally functioning uh, level? And if so, you're not going to get it on Braze unless all that concrete comes up. So, Buffalo Bayou, the channel is highly functional as an ecological asset still, from a sustainability perspective. Braze is no longer an ac a, a ecological asset. And so there's very limited beneficial use to protect that channel. Since Braze Bayou no longer functions in its natural capacity, the floodplain is not a natural asset. Therefore, the sustainability approach would be to reduce the area of the 100-year floodplain to prevent loss of human life, property damage, and the disruption of existing communities. So here is another look at the area, specifically zooming into the mid-Braze area and the communities that we're working with. The blue is the 100-year floodplain. There are several communities there. Greater Myerland. You know, people talk about Myerland. Everybody knows the word Myerland, but we don't think about the others as well. Near South, Southwest, Westbury, Braze Oaks, Braeburn. There are several other people in here as well suffering the same fate. And here is a, a map uh, with, with uh, not, not very, a satellite image with not very good detail. But the area, again, that's kind of gold is the floodplain, and you can see it's a lot of people live in this space. This is not a natural floodplain. People live here, and so we need to be protected. I live here, and two other people in the audience I met today also live there. So I know how this water functions. I know how, what, what happens when it comes up, uh, and depending on the rain that happens. Um, I'm sorry, the approach that we're taking our team is to look at three different areas. Uh, again, sustainability is about balance, so we're looking at a business of usual, usual scenario, uh, a smart infrastructure and mitigation kind of scenario. Arturo Leon is also on our team, and you heard him speak yesterday. Um, and he's interested in smart infrastructure. And the third focus is look, really look at the communities and, and help with uh, mitigation and adaptation planning at the community level. It's not something that's normally happening in the city of Houston, and, and we would like to help, and we believe that's where the universities can come in, because there's not yet companies with a business plan that can do it. There's no business out there for planning, which is why a lot of the people that do planning in Houston are civil engineering firms or uh, landscape architectural firms, um, and they're doing a fantastic job with their, from their background uh, with, with the little bit of work uh, for, for planning that's done. So there's no good business model out there for planning. There, the uh, central government is too small, uh, quite frankly, to have enough community planners. And you heard my, uh, my colleague Jeff say earlier that 
Uh, Houston is one of the best at putting out staff out there because of our budget. Well, 51% of the people who hold jobs, 51% of the jobs that are available in the city of Houston are not held by people who live in the city. And if people here depend on, if this, the government depends on property taxes to function, then, then quite frankly, our $5 billion budget might be 10 billion to 15 billion if we had a greater representation of people who held jobs within the city limit. I'm just saying, it's not enough. We have about 88 communities within the city of Houston as uh, identified by Mayor Brown back in 96. And I don't think we have 88 planners in the planning department. Um, so this is where I think uh, academia could come in and offer some assistance and hopefully it could, we could get it to the point where it could be a business plan uh, if there's funding available, of course. Hopefully there could be a model that could be adapted by some companies to actually do this because our communities really do need this kind of support. Here's a look at some of the work we're doing. Again, we're not following this rhetoric of buyouts because there's no scientific basis for that. So then what we're looking at, and also there's not enough money for that, by the way, quite frankly. Um, uh, I know somebody who just sold their home in the, in the flooded area for a little bit over $300,000. Um, this is a home that was flooded. And so the 100,000 that Harris County wants to make available isn't gonna you know, move a lot of people in, in, the, in that direction. So what can we do? What can we do to help? Well, we can look at some ways in which we can bring a lot of the stuff you guys are talking about uh, to help. And it's gonna have to be a comprehensive uh, uh, element. It's gonna have to be some resilience in terms of people raising their homes, and it's gonna be a look at some more detention uh, uh, capabilities and definitely the smart infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier. Those are things that would help. Uh, this is the end of my presentation, and I invite you guys, uh, if, if anybody has any recommendations or suggestions or feel as if they can contribute, uh, please contact me and let me know. Um, and I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? You know, the natural system doesn't automatically segregate itself into 100 year, 500 year claims. It's, those are statistical estimates we make. And for planning purposes, we shouldn't get too hung up just on those two maps. So when you look at that map, your brain has to realize you know, there also is a 100 year floodplain. There's a 10 year flood area and a 15 year flood area, a 30 year flood area, and a, and a 100 year flood area. So, yeah, I agree you, you probably do not need or can afford to purchase all homes other than a 100 year flood area. But for low hanging fruit, if you can identify homes that are in the 10 year flood area, that might be a, a wiser way to spend your money. So, so don't get hung up just on those two labels. The natural world doesn't well, actually segregate into a hundred years of five hundred years. Thank you, thank you very much for your perspective, and it's, it's, well, it's well taken. You're right. Uh, that is the, coming from the science perspective. Um, however, from the uh, social perspective and social economic policy side, uh, homeowners, uh, homeowners have different rates when it comes to uh, flood insurance based on that flood plane. And that money is a very integral part of a person's budget and it really will make the difference as to whether or not they can stay in some instances or whether they'll stay in an apartment, leave their home vacant, um, or try to figure out ways in which they could you know, get a loan from the city. Or, so, so we have to take it into consideration because of the political uh, considerations of the 100 and the, the 500 year flood plan. But if you're a Herbert planner and if you have only a finite amount of money to buy up homes, would you prefer to buy up a home that's on the 10 year flood plan or the home that's on the very, very edge of the 100 year flood plan? Um, I, I would actually prefer, uh, and again, I, I hope one of the things that I impressed on you is this idea of, of, of gathering information from many different places. So I don't want you to feel as if I'm throwing out your, your opinions. Um, but it needs to be a coordinated approach, and it shouldn't be a one-off approach. Um, offering folks the idea of voluntary buyout 
um, is, is kind of a simplistic approach as well, right? Because you're going to get a hodgepodge neighborhood, and, and what are you going to do with a quarter acre lot? Anyway, right? I, I mean, I've been in, in, in Will Meadows for 17 years, and there is a lot that's been sitting on the block that's been vacant for that long. The city are, is not using that property for detention. It is not contributing to, to water infiltration, infiltration to any any uh, significant uh, extent. And uh, quite frankly, it's a loss to the tax rolls then because it's not the other. So it needs to be done in a coordinated manner. But you know, I, I hear what you're saying. It's very very well taken. Yes. Uh, just as a note, the Harris County Flood Control District looks at at least three criteria. Uh, one is it in a hopelessly flooded area with 10 percent uh, floodplain. The second is is it a group of houses to avoid that checkerboard look that you like. And third is it in an area where you can't do structural approaches. And so I think the idea of just assuming that oh we'll buy out one house here and one house there uh, doesn't reflect the reality of how at least the Houston from the Harris County Flood Control District, views priorities of floodplain house, uh, floodplain buyouts. Um, th thank you, thank you. My, my example, notwithstanding, um, my understanding is over time, the county's getting getting more uh, rational with regards to how it targets 